a group of diplomatic and military officials tasked with CBMs and boundary related issues with China for four years. He was also the desk officer for the USA and Canada, an officer on special duty in charge of press relations in the external publicity division. On deputation for four years with the National Security Council Secretariat under the Prime Minister's office, Ambassador Chinoy worked on internal and external national security policy and anchored strategic dialogues with key interlocutors around the world. He is fluent in English and Chinese Mandarin and conversant in French, Spanish, German, Japanese, Arabic, Urdu, and French Creole. Apart from being a polyglot, he is also a polymath, and I take special pleasure in telling all of you that he is uh, a sitarist as well, and you see his renditions of uh, Gandhiji's bhajans on the YouTube. Please enjoy them when you have time. So welcome, Ambassador Chinoy. I also have uh, the great privilege and honor in uh, introducing my uh, very special colleague, Professor Dipargha Mukherjee, uh, who is going to be a part of today's proceedings. Uh, Professor Mukherjee is a faculty member of the economics area at IIM Nagpur. His teaching and research interests include international trade and investment agreements, services trade, economics of outsourcing and IT integration in India. Prior to joining IIM Nagpur, Professor Mukherjee has been a visiting research fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore, and a research fellow at the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations, New Delhi. Professor Mukherjee has completed his doctoral studies fellow program in management from the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, in the area of economics and social sciences with a minor in finance. Professor Mukherjee is a certified financial risk manager and has also worked as a business analyst and assistant manager in the advanced analytics department with HSBC and Citibank for over three years before pursuing his doctoral studies. Previously, he had obtained a master's degree in economics from the Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi. Uh, apart from that, Professor Mukherjee is also an accomplished singer of the Ravindra Shangeet. Okay. Welcome to the two of you and Professor Mukherjee. May you kindly introduce the topic to all of us before we can hear from the ambassador and you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you for provided quite a broad introduction of me. Thank you for doing such a generous job. Thank you also for having me to anchor this discussion today. Uh, as we all know, and it's, it's going to be a pleasure to hear out Ambassador Chinoy as, as we go along. So as, as we all know, the title for today's uh, discussion is India-Japan Special Strategic and Global Partnership with specific focus on economic cooperation. Now I'll take the first few minutes to just introduce and establish to why uh, this topic is of keen interest at this hour. And uh, then we'll go, go to hear, hear out Ambassador Chenon. So, uh, so, so for the for the, for the entire audience, I think Japan and India has had quite a special relationship, if I would have to put it that way. And some facts can be placed in order for that. Uh, we all know that uh, Japan, in the last century, was probably the only developed country of Asia, and through the 1960s and 70s, had uh, quick development. It, uh, it it kind of established itself as one of the powers in the, in the region as well as globally. And India uh, started off with a model of import substituting industrialization. We wanted to do it by ourselves. And uh, by early 1980s, India realized that we had to kind of start looking at things differently. And that's the time when uh, we see the first significant uh, FDI coming in to India and that is with Maruti Suzuki. Mind you, before that, India was totally closed, and uh, it's only in the 1990s that we really talk about opening up of the economy. So 1980 saw the coming of Maruti Suzuki. It started, and it was immensely successful till date. We are, I'm sure we all of us are aware the kind of market share that Maruti Suzuki enjoys in India. Now, that's the beginning. So 
Till 90s, Japan entered a phase of stagnation. We, we call it the lost decade for Japan. Uh, it tried to evolve out of it, uh, space certain bottlenecks. 2012 onwards, we had the Abe era, tried to rejig. However, in, huge impressive growth from Japan is still to come by. India, on the other hand, has seen good growth through 1990s and the 2000s. However, the other aspect that, that comes into this picture when we analyze it, and this is all in the region, we see the phenomenal growth of China starting 1980s when they started building up for facing the world. And then through 1990s and 2000s, China gathered enough economic power and arsenal. It became a force to reckon with, so much so that in the, in the recent past, uh, it has entered into uh, substantial uh, disagreements with its neighbors on territorial disputes, it has entered into disputes with Japan, with Southeast Asian countries. We do not need to overemphasize the situation on our own borders currently as we speak, and uh, we know that, that Today morning itself, I think Chinese army is trying to gear up. We have heard uh, disturbing developments in the news. And uh, alongside, there have been defense cooperations as well between Japan, India, US. We, 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 there is the Quad, where Australia also comes into the picture. Japan and India have kind of agreed to do joint fighter drills, military supply sharing pact. That et cetera, et cetera. Those are the more recent developments. So both economically and on national security strategy side, India and Japan are poised for uh, mutually beneficial uh, partnerships, all in all. So naturally, it, it, it warrants a, a good discussion and we, we, we can kind of try and assess the situation on defense and it closely relates to the economic interest for both nations. Remember Japan, uh, is trouble with an aging economy. India is said to have the demographic dividend, so on and so forth. But how do we all take it together, both on the defense side, where it is becoming increasingly important, India's role is also set to increase in the region, Indian Ocean, South China Sea, etc. Uh, let us now uh, go to Ambassador Chennai and first hear your views out, sir, as how you assess the situation and how we take it from there. You are on mute, Ambassador Chenna. Ambassador, you are on mute. Uh, Ambassador, you are on mute. Uh, you have to unmute, Ambassador um, Sampath. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. That's right. Yes. I, I, I wasn't in control. I couldn't unmute myself. So I was uh, waiting for the host to unmute me. But thank you very much. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, when I chair uh, webinars, I'm often told that as chair, I'm supposed to be seen and not heard really. But today I'm not chairing anything. I'm expected to be the uh, speaker. And therefore, I'm glad that uh, uh, I have unmuted myself and you have also unmuted me. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Dipargo Mukherjee for uh, those, those very kind words. Uh, Professor Rahul Seth for that uh, broad introduction that you gave. And between the two of you, you also set the tone for uh, this afternoon's interaction on my favorite subject, which is the special strategic and global partnership between India and Japan, two very natural partners. Now, before we come to the uh, you know broad parameters of the special strategic and uh, global partnership in the 21st century, where we have really seen it bloom, it is very important to understand a little bit of uh, the relationship in past centuries. And perhaps you are aware of it, but I think I should cover that ground as well, for it will uh, position us better to discuss the present when we take a little bit uh, of a look into the past as well. So our two countries have traditionally enjoyed extremely warm and friendly relations, and it's a known fact that uh, the foundations of our relations uh, go back centuries. Uh, they go back over a millennium. Uh, and uh, they are deeply rooted uh, in uh, 
the civilizational ethos of the two countries primarily uh, they have been forged on the anvil of buddhism uh, many of us are aware that uh, in 752 uh, we had the buddhist uh, monk uh, bodhi sena who was then uh, traveling in china the indian monk was traveling in china and he was invited by the japanese emperor uh, to uh, go to nara for the uh, the eye opening ceremony the consecration ceremony of the great buddha statue there uh, and uh, bodhi dharma the other great uh, monk from india who traveled to uh, china uh, in the uh, late 5th century ad early 6th century ad uh, has also had a huge impact on japan uh, incidentally bodhi dharma never went to japan he founded the zen school of buddhism uh, at the shaolin monastery in central china uh, but his disciples and his teachings spread Uh, during the primarily during the tang dynasty period uh, to japan and uh, it kind of took very deep roots there bodhi dharma is to be seen as an ubiquitous figure in every uh, shop that sells trinkets in japan uh, it's the figure of a seated uh, indian looking man with uh, big uh, you know whiskers uh, and um, big eyes uh, big bushy eyebrows and that's bodhi dharma uh, so we have this uh, past connect between us uh, which uh, actually is very good because it has provided a very firm foundation for what has happened uh, centuries later uh, there is also a great similarity in terms of hindu buddhist thought and philosophy uh, between some of our uh, what, uh, how can i put it uh, the animistic uh, practices that we have in india uh, which is a tradition in many religious uh, sects across uh, the country and uh, shintoism they also share a great deal in common one of the key points there is uh, respecting and revering the environment for instance revering the natural elements and i'm so glad today that you are dedicating a tree uh, in in uh, sort of honor of this uh, uh, lecture of ours today uh, to the sundarbans because that would really make every japanese also very happy uh, such is their pride in their own environment and uh, the, the great efforts that they make to protect that and en their environment uh, it, it's it's somewhat similar to the kind of dedication you've shown today uh, so we have similarities in terms of several of our hindu gods also being found in japan in the japanese pantheon it is not uh, uncommon to see uh, you know lakshmi uh, and saraswati uh, and ganesh uh, uh, shiva etc so this is again something that brings us together the great genius of japan uh, kukoi or kubotai shi i had actually brought the indian siddham letters uh, to uh, Jap japan in uh, and around the 10th century ad and then there is a great similarity between the hiragana katagana uh, phonetic scripts uh, uh, and uh, sanskrit uh, there is similarity in the grammatical syntax uh, our musical instruments are also similar the indian veena and the japanese biva are again very similar uh, there are several sanskrit words in the japanese language including seva uh, goma as in homa uh, goma is homa seva is seva it means exactly the same thing in in sanskrit and in japanese and tori as in the toran uh, you know the kind of toran that we have on our, on our gateways uh, again has found a uh, deep root in uh, japanese culture then there is the uh, you know the fondness for the indian curry uh, or the japanese curry and many of you may not know that its roots uh, lie in the uh, you know, sort of geo strategic changes that mark the beginning of the 20th century when there was uh, a naval alliance between great britain uh, and japan between 1902 and 1923 uh, japan wasn't quite yet the militaristic power that it later became and as you know it fought the first world war on the side of the allies uh, and uh, uh, against germany so to speak so during that period of naval cooperation uh, the british had uh, advised the japanese uh, to do something about uh, rickets the problem of uh, rickets that uh, you know uh, beri beri that uh, prevailed among japanese uh, sailors and um, this was essentially because of uh, i think a vitamin d Uh, or some such deficiency that could be overcome uh, by uh, eating certain foods primarily wheat wheat was a source of some of these vitamins to overcome beriberi 
And uh, the Japanese, unfortunately, uh, did not eat wheat products unless they were snacks. It wasn't really food for them, especially in the villages from where the naval sailors came. So the British, uh, you know, told them how to make a curry in which wheat flour would also be used and mixed with the favorite meats uh, that the Japanese are fond of, uh, which is beef and pork and, and, and things like that. And that is how the British taught the Japanese Navy to come up with a food product that would be readily accepted uh, along with rice, a, a curry that has wheat flour as a base in it. That's very unusual in India. We don't use that. And that is how India got Japan uh, eating a curry that is now known in Japan as the Japanese curry. Uh, so there is that great curry connect also between us. And Yokohama, uh, which is a naval base in Japan, uh, is the only place in the world that celebrates annually uh, a very big curry festival. Not even India has a curry festival. The Japanese have that. Then there is, of course, that connect of uh, the Indian revolutionaries like Rash Bihari Bose that you were mentioning a while ago, Professor Rahul, uh, and uh, uh, you know Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, who found in Japan that sympathy, that base, uh, that support for India's uh, uh, you know sort of a struggle for uh, for sovereignty uh, and nationhood. Uh, and um, Tagore was instrumental also in bringing the two countries closer. Though I dare say that he had a, a fairly strong view of the militarization of Japan that accompanied uh, Japan's industrialization uh, after the Meiji restoration in the 1860s. And so when Tagore went there for his lectures on a number of occasions, uh, as uh, uh, late as in 1916, he had prophesied that the Japanese had militarized uh, too much and that this might ultimately uh, cause their downfall. He had uh, very presciently uh, spoken of uh, uh, Japan going up in flames, which is what happened in the Second World War as a result of uh, some of those policies. Um, judge uh, Radha Binod Pal, of course, as you all know, was the dissenting judge at the end of the Second uh, World War. Uh, and the Japanese still revere him very front fondly. Uh, uh, there is a mural uh, dedicated to uh, the judge uh, in the uh, uh, heart of Tokyo, uh, at the Yasukuni Shrine itself, no less. Uh, so we have to keep in mind this, uh, you know, broad historical connect that we had. But uh, this did not mean that there was anything very special about the relationship at that point. There was nothing really very strategic about it. There was nothing very global about it. It was simply uh, a, a complacent relationship uh, of uh, mutual admiration, uh, somewhat bordering on the fantastic and romantic uh, for both sides uh, and really not based on a firm economic uh, foundation. And we went through the 50s and 60s uh, in such manner as well, uh, you know, gifting each other uh, exotic things. India would give an elephant to uh, Japan and, 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 and the Japanese would, you know, likewise celebrate Indian culture in that Western romanticized fashion. Japan, as uh, Professor Mukherjee mentioned, uh, resurrected itself phoenix-like from the flames of the Second World War, supported by, uh, you know, uh, a, a Japan-specific kind of martial plan, uh, where, you know, the emperor had been uh, reduced uh, uh, in terms of his power and authority, uh, and uh, the Japanese economy was beginning to, to revive itself through the 50s, it rebranded itself, as you know, at one point of time uh, in the uh, 60s, having, uh, like China, in first uh, flush been castigated for being, you know, cheap and, and, and low quality and, and uh, you know, almost akin to some kind of a, a Japanese peril that was flooding the markets uh, of the United States of America. So just as China, uh, uh, more recently, Japan too went through that. Uh, you know, parlous phase in its interaction with that one great big market across the Pacific, that is the United States of America, uh, that was uh, capable of, uh, uh, you know, being the proverbial high tide that could lift all boats in the, uh, you know, Asian landmass. It did that for Japan in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. The 80s were a good period until they hit, uh, you know, uh, a, a sort of uh, 
uh, impediment in the 1990s and there was a period of stagnation as well. Uh, so uh, during this period, I would say that a lot of Japanese policies towards India were driven by uh, the precepts of the Cold War. Now, we have to keep in mind that the Japanese had an alliance partnership with the United States after their great defeat and uh, destruction and emasculation uh, in the Second World War, such that on matters uh, beyond the immediate mercantile aspects of uh, global trade uh, and uh, economic engagement, they always took a cue uh, from what the United States was doing. So the Cold War played a very big role, I think, in Japan's outlook towards India. And this continued uh, until uh, the Indian uh, economy began to show signs of opening up. Uh, but by then, uh, I should posit this uh, uh, you know, fact that uh, a lot of the oxygen in the Asian landmass had already been sucked out by the rise of the Chinese economy, which had the advantage of being uh, you know, the first mover, the early bird that catches the worm because the Chinese had opened up in the 1970s and two very big things had happened. Uh, one was uh, the great rapprochement between the United States and China, uh, the Nixon visit and uh, you know, the Shanghai communique of 1972. Uh, and that was another signal to the Japanese to follow suit. Uh, so by the time the Chinese opened their, uh, their economy in 1978 with the four modernizations and the open door policy, of Tang Xiaoping, it was not just the United States that was making a beeline uh, into the Chinese economy uh, with uh, massive amounts of foreign direct investment. Uh, it was also Japan that was uh, in the wake of this uh, following uh, suit. And so I would say that by the time the Indian economy uh, began to uh, you know, reform and open up and uh, create the right kind of docking points uh, for Japanese investment to come in, uh, a great deal of uh, their attention had already been uh, you know, taken up uh, by China. And in Japan's case, there was a, a tremendous amount of uh, reliance uh, on uh, resources uh, from overseas, uh, markets, uh, again, overseas, supply chains had developed for Japan, uh, embedded and ensconced in China, in the growing Chinese economy. So as China prospered, Japan prospered. If China didn't prosper, Japan wouldn't prosper. So they developed this kind of symbiotic relationship where much of the strategic view of China in Japan was guided uh, by uh, the fact of life, which was that there was a tremendous interdependence between Japan and that new uh, sort of uh, economic hinterland uh, that they now had acquired in a different way uh, in the People's Republic of China. Certainly, this is not to say that it was a hinterland that smacked off the uh, you know, greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere that they were trying to create in the 1930s, uh, which was more of a dramatic imperial Japan trying to create colonies for raw materials and markets uh, for their uh, rapidly industrializing and, and militarized economy. But akin to that, that symbiotic relationship had been established with China. And I dare say that that continues till today. It still is a major driver of uh, the Japanese outlook on uh, the emerging geostrategic and geoeconomic uh, processes in Asia. But I will come to that later. So it is in this context that uh, Professor Mukherjee mentioned uh, that uh, the Japanese had begun to look at India. And of course, Suzuki, Osamu Suzuki uh, was one of the first uh, champions of this relationship. And with his arrival in India, there was a new wave of uh, you know, business practices of Kaizen and Monozukuri uh, and uh, business practices. Uh, new supply chains uh, came in in the wake of the Suzuki investment. Of course, it was not all hunky-dory from the word go. Uh, in fact, in the beginning, it was a failed operation. And I'm surprised that they hung in uh, you know, by the skin of their teeth uh, to tide over all those initial uh, hiccups and teething problems and get to a stage where they actually started making profits and, and became what they are today. But as you will all agree, they fundamentally altered the landscape in India. And it wasn't just limited to the automotive sector. I think they taught India uh, the uh, you know, logic of uh, globalization, the logic of supply chains, the logic of competition, 
the logic of uh, you know SMEs and MSMEs uh, you know being fired up uh, and and how to move up the value chain uh, all in a group. Uh, so I think that was a, a huge lesson. The kind of lesson that you know we are now uh, you know sort of looking at benefiting from in high speed rail and modernization of the railway sector. But I'll come to that too later. So it is in this broad context that we moved into the 21st century. But this too, we entered the 21st century uh, with a lot of self-doubt about each other because in 1998, when India uh, tested its uh, uh, nuclear weapons, the bottom fell out of the relationship with Japan. Uh, none of that, uh, you know, fundamental uh, strong, uh, you know, pillar of goodwill, uh, civilizational ethos. None of that really helped because the Japanese took. Uh, understandably so from their point of view, having been victims of the atomic bomb uh, in the past, the only country to have suffered that uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they really went after India and cut off, uh, uh, you know, a lot of our normal exchanges. Uh, and I think that came in the way of uh, our uh, uh, economic uh, engagement as well at that point of time. But once again, it helped that the Americans, the French, even the Chinese, uh, who had been extremely uh, upset with India's nuclear tests, uh, had been quick to, uh, you know, become India's interlocutors and the relationship came back onto track in about two years time, including with the Japanese. Uh, uh, and, and that was primarily because they followed the uh, example of what the other big powers were doing, uh, the Americans, French and the Chinese primarily. So uh, we entered this uh, uh, century with uh, uh, Japanese Prime Minister Mori's visit, uh, I think, in 2001. And that kind of uh, became another point of inflection in our relations. But there was the effect of the Asian financial crisis in the end of uh, uh, the 1990s. And there was, again, uh, a global impact of the two global financial and economic crises that followed a decade later. And in many ways, because uh, of Japan's uh, uh, sort of... Uh, interconnectivity uh, with uh, Western countries as well, with the United States of America, Japan did feel uh, some of that impact. It was China that, uh, broadly speaking, moved into the empty spaces with the Chiang Mai initiative, the currency swap agreements, uh, having been relatively unscathed in the uh, Asian financial crisis and also a decade later in the global financial and economic crisis. Japan wasn't quite able to place itself there as uh, the Asian power, uh, the second uh, largest developed economy in the world, which it still is today. Uh, but it, it really couldn't seize that advantage to the same extent. Uh, and I think the single-minded focus that the Chinese had on some of these broad strategic issues, uh, you know, was far more than what the Japanese were capable of with, I should say, their fractious internal LDP politics and frequently changing, uh, you know, prime ministers. It's only Prime Minister Abe who ultimately gave that kind of relative stability over an extended period, at least in his second term, all the way from 2012 to very recently when he demitted office. So this relationship, even in the 21st century, was one of tremendous goodwill, tremendous cultural connect, but not quite having realized its fullest potential. And by the time I went there in 2015, the mandate given to me uh, by the Prime Minister of India was to ensure that this relationship, which had tremendous potential, uh, was to be taken uh, to uh, those heights where one could say satisfactorily that we are actually realizing that potential. Uh, that transformation began to take place after the government came uh, into uh, power in 2014. And Prime Minister Modi had a history, uh, even while in Gujarat, of having had that fabulous personal connect with uh, Japan. Uh, he had, in my view, long admired the Japanese for their uh, numerous achievements. And uh, he had a personal connect with uh, Prime Minister Abe. And so it was almost as if uh, they were made for each other in 2014, when we had Prime Minister Abe on that side and Prime Minister Modi here. And this is not to suggest that the entirety of this relationship rests on a personal connect between uh, you know, personal chemistry between two leaders. Uh, but it did play a very major role in, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, giving that major impetus and thrust 
propulsion to the relationship after 2014. And so the relationship uh, was actually elevated to uh, the subject matter of our talk, which is special strategic and global partnership in 2014. And, uh, uh, you know, the personal goodwill, of course, uh, mattered a great deal. We saw it in the last visit, for instance, which I handled in 2018, October, Prime Minister Modi was the first leader to be taken by uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, to his, uh, you know, uh, ancestral family home in Yamanashi uh, and uh, to be hosted there. In many ways, one can say that uh, Prime Minister Suga, who is now in the chair, uh, who has for long years been uh, former Prime Minister Abe's uh, chief cabinet secretary, uh, has also played a tremendous role in this burgeoning relationship between India and Japan. Um, he has played that key role in actually the evolution of this relationship to what it uh, is today, which is a special strategic and global partnership. And I dare say that uh, at least until uh, he is the prime minister, and which is kind of uh, guaranteed uh, as far as guarantees go in Japanese politics till September 2021, uh, when uh, you know the current uh, uh, original term of Prime Minister Abe will end and there will be fresh LDP elections for the presidency, uh, he will obviously continue with that uh, policy with great commitment. And that was self-apparent in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, virtual meeting between the two leaders, the summit that was held um, uh, quite recently. Uh, so what I would like to say here is that the relationship is special in many ways. It's uh, increasingly global uh, because of the nature of globalization, the fact that the Indian economy has also come a long way since the early 90s when um, Suzuki was still trying to meander in the Indian economy and find its way around uh, to succeed. Uh, and Japan has always been a global economy. If, if, if anything, it, she has been a global economy. And so we have uh, a robust dialogue mechanism uh, in place. Um, institutional arrangements are firmly in place. Uh, we, for instance, at the political level, have a regular annual uh, you know, uh, dialogue at the level of the prime ministers. Now, it's uh, a lamentable fact that uh, in 2019, Prime Minister Abe's visit, visit to India couldn't take place because uh, of the prevailing situation uh, in India's, uh, uh, you know, northeast and elsewhere in India at that point of time. Uh, and in 2020, unfortunately, the, the entire world is today reeling under the, uh, you know, uh, very deleterious effects of uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, no exceptions, whether Japan or India. And so uh, uh, that, of course, uh, has been physical meetings have been put off. But there are two plus two ministerials in place. Um, you know, we connect in the in the context of our cooperation uh, within uh, with the ASEAN. Uh, you've all been hearing of uh, our cooperation in the context of the Quad, which is really the quadrilateral security dialogue, which is uh, kind of the nucleus of the Indo-Pacific vision that has recently uh, developed. Uh, and we saw how Dr. Jaishankar, notwithstanding COVID, uh, had flown to uh, Tokyo for the Quad Security Dialogue meeting on the 6th of October. And he also had bilateral meetings with his counterparts there, including uh, Foreign Minister Motegi. Uh, so there is a very strong convergence today between the uh, two countries uh, um, on the... On the uh, Japanese side, they've had this broad vision of the Indo-Pacific going back to Prime Minister Abe's speech to the Indian parliament uh, 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 more than a decade ago when he had spoken of the confluence of the two seas. The Japanese understand the logic of uh, the kind of undergirding, uh, you know, uh, that uh, trade and technology provides to these broad oceanic and continental spaces. Because we ourselves have seen how in recent years, uh, the traditional engines of economic growth, global economic growth have shifted, particularly uh, over the last 25 to 30 years uh, to the Asian landmass. And uh, we have seen how uh, the economic uh, uh, you know, growth and prosperity has actually then had a horizontal spread in Asia. Uh, it, it had a vertical spread first uh, in China and China continued to grow for many years. Uh, including at double-digit uh, rates. Uh, but then there has also been a horizontal spread. 
that 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 great trans pacific uh, you know kind of connect to the asian economies that the us economy provided uh, the market that it provided for growth was not just limited to japan uh, after japan it was the turn of the asian tigers that benefited korea taiwan hong kong singapore and then Uh, from the late uh, 1970s it is china that benefited uh, but thereafter that spread has also taken place in the rest of asia there's been a a kind of uh, osmosis uh, of uh, economic growth and prosperity from east asia to southeast asia and then to south asia as well all the way across the western indian ocean to the east coast of africa and it is in that broad context that japan also appreciates that there is something uh, called the indo pacific now which is a more contemporary a more realistic a more representative uh, sort of uh, framework in which to see the processes of economic growth and development in the 21st century just as the asia pacific uh, was the right fit for the second half of the 20th century because that's the area where that first uh, you know sort of uh, bloom of growth was taking place between the american economy and the economies of east asia uh and so asia pacific it was rightly so for 50 years between uh, the end of the second world war and the end of the 20th century but today of course uh, even if the chinese don't like the term indo pacific and they see that as an erosion of their own centrality and importance which went with the uh, you know uh, the asia pacific framework the fact is that this is the new reality the japanese understand that very well over the years they have also seen in a broad geo strategic context that uh, they have had their ups and downs with china the chinese have made them feel enormously guilty uh, for all their you know war time and imperial uh, japanese policies of the 1930s in particular when in 1932 the japanese had set up uh, uh, you know that so called puppet uh, manchu ko in, in manchuria and uh, they had uh, taken over vast uh, tracts of uh, Uh, territory in uh, east china and uh, northeastern china including in manchuria in the late 1930s uh, and not to speak of how the chinese view uh, you know the uh, what they call quote and quote nanjing massacre uh, so notwithstanding all that there was an element of guilt that had built up in japanese society among japanese business which came to the fore when in the 70s as i said they followed the americans into investments in china and at that point of time they also normalized their relations in 1972 uh, they had uh, the uh, you know normalization of relations in 1977 um, uh, that's right uh, 1977 they also uh, had uh, the treaty of uh, uh, peace and uh, you know friendship and cooperation so in other words uh, relations were back on to normal track but there was a one sided pressure the chinese would pressurize the japanese to do more to do more by way of reparations to the people of china and the japanese kept pumping in money they don't didn't do this out of sheer goodwill they also saw that there was a great deal of profit to be made but they were also aware of the uh, fundamental uh, you know contradictions and friction uh, between the two countries going back to the war time years uh, and then uh, also manifested in Uh, territorial disputes uh, over the uh, what the japanese call the senkakus and what the chinese call the tiaoyu islands and this is something uh, that they kept in mind when they evolved this policy of china plus 1 uh, so therefore they were always very clear that it was important for japan not to put all its eggs in one basket but the one basket that there was was so tempting that uh, as i said almost all the oxygen was being sucked out of the the japanese space by the chinese and um, the chinese also performed well so there were profits being made by the japanese companies they were being supported there were special cow outs for them uh, they were given red carpet treatment uh, and of course uh, off and on uh, you know uh, eggs uh, and black paint was also thrown at their embassies and consulates whenever it was uh, in the context of the disputes in the senkaku so mass mobilization against the japanese from time to time which only created more pressure for the japanese to do more and to behave uh, you know better and to put in more money in china that resulted in something like a cumulative uh, you know 250 billion dollars roughly including grants in aid and oda etc 
uh, vast sums of money going to china from japan and uh, that uh, is something that uh, has now been even more uh, sort of closely scrutinized as a result of uh, the decoupling uh, which was kind of taking place even before the pandemic struck because there was a decoupling in in, in place as a result of this great rift between the united states and uh, china the rift because uh, took place because the the, the americans finally woke up uh, to the fact that they had this massive imbalance in trade um, just as we do with china and that uh, president trump had decided that he was going to do something very very particular and concrete uh, concretely about it and so uh, the decoupling was kind of uh, already progressing and the pandemic has only uh, emphasized that even more uh, by highlighting uh, the fact that many supply chains can be held hostage under pandemic conditions that an over reliance on any one particular country whether for ppe or masks or for any kind of you know semiconductors or pharmaceuticals or or electronics or telecommunications would not be in the interest of any one particular country and that's what's pushed japan today to take a fresh look at decoupling uh, they have offered 2.2 billion dollars as you know uh, to get their companies to decouple of course 2 billion of that is reserved for companies to move into japan and about 200 uh, million dollars is reserved for japanese companies to move into other countries um, they have encouraged about 30 countries to move into the rest of asia uh, of which i am told only a couple a couple of countries have actually chosen to come to india but that's a separate issue why not india why taiwan why rok uh, why even mexico far away uh, why uh, vietnam why thailand but then each of these has offered in niche areas uh, tremendous uh, you know docking points uh, they have done very well and um, uh, the japanese of course traditionally have a mindset in which they have not stepped out beyond their uh, immediate uh, you know comfort zone in east asia or uh, their larger comfort zone in southeast asia so one of the limiting factors has also been this cultural uh, sort of uh, you know blinker that they have had despite knowing us through history through buddhism through friendship in the past in terms of business they have not had that familiarity beyond southeast asia even so they have realized over the years that that china plus one policy needs to be pursued aggressively that there must be a strategy for for risk mitigation at the end of the day uh, and they were sensitive to that requirement even before the pandemic since the pandemic is struck the japanese have been also working hard uh, to do trilateral dialogues for instance with india and australia on uh, the resilience of uh, supply chains to to build resilient supply chains in a number of uh, sectors so there is that uh, growing relationship but let me cover a few other points also uh, quite randomly at that but that is the nature of this uh, discourse this afternoon um, so in the field of defense let me put it this way the japanese have a tremendous uh, uh, sort of uh, economic uh, and industrial foundation as you are all aware uh, after the meiji uh, restoration uh, japan became a huge military power in asia it was a juggernaut in uh, in asia that couldn't have been stopped uh, quite easily it took the americans uh, atomic bombs to stop the japanese so that is the kind of uh, militarization that they had achieved and in many ways after the great war the americans uh, kind of put a full stop to all that uh, but allowed the japanese to continue their good work in you know avionics and electronics and semiconductors and, and rare earths and so i mean they are very good uh, at, at the top of the food chain uh, when it comes to certain uh, you know high technologies and that combined with uh, uh, their great capacity for innovation uh, and research and development that combined with the 7 trillion us dollars worth of funds that they are sitting on you know unproductive funds sitting in their banks with uh, negative interest rates it makes for a, a tremendous combination uh, and and potentially uh, beneficial to any partner who can plug in with the japanese to get their money to get their technology and that's where india comes in because india has talented human resources uh, and and we also have our own uh, you know fairly good record at uh, r and d at innovation even jugad 
uh, you know, uh, of, 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 of sorts that uh, others cannot even imagine. Uh, and I'm not saying this pejoratively, but in admiration for our capacities. And uh, to get that and, and to combine it with Japanese technology uh, is something that India saw uh, as greatly beneficial. For the Japanese, uh, I think the keen desire was to ensure that apart from China, uh, they would also have certain alternative destinations. And in this entire space between India and Japan, there are so many countries vying for the same affection of Japan, vying for the same FDI, the same technology, the same money. Uh, and uh, that includes, uh, you know, Taiwan and Vietnam and, and uh, Thailand, uh, even Korea, uh, with which the Japanese are extremely familiar. They having actually been, uh, you know, uh, ruling that Korean peninsula uh, for uh, considerable time, just as they did uh, Taiwan. So the point here is that uh, uh, in, in that sense, the Japanese uh, uh, kind of saw India as a scaled up model. One of our USPs uh, was essentially that we were a scaled up model of all the good things that everybody else was offering. In a niche area, uh, you know, you would see that Thailand uh, was capable of offering ex excellent terms in the automotive sector. In semiconductors and electronics, Vietnam was, was uh, a, a very beautiful destination for Japanese investment. But they were not scaled up models. And so when the Japanese looked at the future, uh, when they looked at the prospects of uh, having a launching pad in Asia for, say, the African market or, or having a manufacturing hub uh, with very low uh, uh, sort of uh, manufacturing costs, uh, 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 benefiting from labor arbitrage of the kind that they benefited from in China in the first phase, they could only see India there. Uh, even if India was not able to match up to all their expectations, they were quite determined that India had this huge potential and that they would uh, stay the course uh, with India. And in recent years, we've also made great efforts to try and uh, improve our, uh, you know, conditions, uh, policies and, you know, framework uh, for inviting Japanese investments. So in the defense sector also, uh, as we have moved into this space with uh, programs like Atmanirbhar Bharat in uh, the defense sector, the announcement of 108 uh, you know, items which will no longer be imported. Uh, we obviously look to Japan, which has formidable defense technologies, as I mentioned. But there is a fly in the ointment here. And that is that the Japanese have never really, uh, you know, been major defense exporters. Such is the nature of their economy that uh, only about 4% of their, uh, you know, uh, defense production uh, is exported. 96% uh, is consumed. Uh, for their own defense uh, needs. In around 2013, they came up with new defense export guidelines. By then, uh, most of the Indian companies that had earlier been on the entities list, a kind of uh, mirror uh, reflection of entities lists that had been created in the earlier days by the United States of America, especially after our first peaceful nuclear explosion, explosion in 1974. Those entities lists in Japan no longer by 2013 contained any Indian company's name. So theoretically, we could do much more with Japanese companies. And that too, because they were reforming their defense export guidelines. And they were also under Prime Minister Modi becoming more active in terms of cooperating, in terms of, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, collaborating with uh, others in uh, the defense of Japan, even beyond the immediate territory of Japan. Uh, and so there is hope there that we can do more. Uh, they made this uh, proposal, as you know, uh, to sell us the US-2 amphibian plane, uh, but that wasn't quite uh, exactly at the price that we wanted it. It's uh, uh, usage uh, uh, in, in our uh, uh, operational requirements was also moot, uh, and uh, therefore it didn't really go very far. Uh, what we really wanted the Japanese to do was to step in and... Um, you know, be part of the rough and tumble of tendering in India uh, for the huge defense contracts when India is kind of spending about $10 billion annually on acquiring defense uh, equipment and platforms. We wanted the Japanese there uh, to, to, to be part of the tendering process. But unfortunately, with no experience uh, and with this proclivity for G2G, uh, safe ways of doing things, etc., the Japanese were the last people who would want and come and, you know, play the game 
the, the way the British and the Americans and the Israelis uh, were, were quite experienced at. They wouldn't have lasted a day. Uh, so we were trying to encourage them and still do that they must come in uh, and actually be part of this uh, process uh, of change in India in the defense sector. In the defense sector now, in fact, the opportunity is that because these 108 items or more will be uh, restricted uh, or prohibited for imports, this is the chance for Japanese companies to come in and actually team up with some of our uh, companies, uh, which are very active, whether it is Bharat Forge or Tata's or, or um, uh, you know, uh, Adani or uh, the Mahindra's uh, LNT. They're all so active. And there are so many good companies in India. Uh, you know, no thanks to the government, they've been doing their own work, R&D, et cetera, developing specialized high-tech products, becoming part of supply chains in the defense sector in the region as well, um, and sometimes totally unrelated to uh, the kind of support that DRDO or uh, DPSUs might uh, offer some vendors. You know, they're doing this on their own. So there is this great hope and expectation that the Japanese can finally dock in uh, and become part of these JVs, et cetera, build these you know, sort of uh, 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 initial products in India, uh, uh, go through the, uh, you know, run the gauntlet of, uh, uh, you know, approvals, etc., and be part of the uh, defense manufacturing process. We have also deepened our naval cooperation with the Japanese, not just uh, in the Quad, even bilaterally. All their assets that go uh, to the, uh, you know, Gulf region for anti-piracy operations in the special, uh, you know, task forces there, uh, they, on their return, uh, uh, they uh, sort of uh, stop by in India, whether maritime assets or air assets, and they exercise with us. Likewise, when we go anywhere towards that part of the world, including beyond, uh, say, to uh, Alaska for the red flag exercise with the Americans, etc., our assets stop by in Japan uh, to, uh, you know, cooperate with them. We also have some key foundational agreements in place on uh, the security of classified information uh, and um, that is equivalent to the uh, you know gisomia agreement that we had signed with the americans in 2002 uh, and uh, more recently we have signed the axa agreement with them that is the acquisition and cross servicing agreement which is a logistics agreement uh, uh, which actually theoretically makes it possible for the japanese to use our bases etc for refueling etc uh, for their operational turnarounds and uh, theoretically, we can also access uh, their base in Djibouti, where a lot of action is taking place, you know. Um, so we have the multilateral exercises. We have bilateral exercises like uh, Japan, India, uh, you know, naval exercise called GIMEX. Um, uh, uh, we uh, have had that regularly. The Malabar is a very, very key naval exercise, uh, which took place, as you know, in a uh, kind of uh, quadrilateral format. Uh, with Singapore's participation as well. So that, that, that means five countries way back in 2007, uh, primarily in the aftermath of the great tsunami, when the first responders like uh, India, uh, Australia, Japan, and the United States had come together. Uh, and with Singapore done uh, a one-off event in 2007. Thereafter, uh, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd of Australia had pulled the rug uh, from the Malabar, from below the, beneath the Malabar exercise. And uh, then we had all gone our, each our own ways. The Malabar thereafter was basically a bilateral exercise between India and the United States, with Japan coming in on and off. Until in 2015, when I was there as ambassador, we made Japan a permanent invitee. And since then, Japan has been part of it. We are now looking at the possibility of the Malabar, also including Australia, once again. In the meantime, it has helped that we have ramped up our defense cooperation with Australia to match the kind of progress that we have made with the United States and uh, also with Japan. Uh, so uh, we hope that this will go forward. A key agreement we signed some years ago, as you are aware, is also in civil nuclear energy cooperation. Now, that has not seen uh, a great deal of uh, immediate results for us, but it was a very emphatic point that was being made, which is that a country like Japan, which had not signed uh, such an agreement with uh, uh, any country of uh, India's uh, sort of uh, character, that is to say, a non-NPT signatory, yet a nuclear weapons country. Uh, it was a, a dramatic change in Japan's outlook uh, towards India. The same Japan that had 
criticized India in 1998 and had stopped all kinds of cooperation, uh, had ended up in 2015 signing this fundamental uh, agreement with us. It also showed how practical the Japanese were becoming rapidly and how uh, alert they were becoming to the changing geostrategic environment in the region. We have a robust space dialogue, a robust cyber dialogue uh, with the Japanese side. We have uh, uh, regular uh, uh, dialogues at the level of the national security advisors. And Prime Minister Modi has always said that India and Japan together will play a very major role in Asia's emergence. Uh, former Prime Minister Abe used to also say very frequently that uh, Japan is, a, is an anchor uh, you know, in uh, India's uh, uh, transformation, that this relationship is the one that's blessed with the largest potential of any relationship in the world. Uh, Abe used to also say that robust relations between India and Japan are a public good. You know? And I, I firmly believe that because over the years, Japan has, as you can see, emerged as a, as a very firm anchor in India's economic transformation. Um, the annual survey of uh, JBIC, uh, the Japan Bank uh, for International Cooperation, uh, as late as financial year 2019, has still put India in the number one position. Um, uh, you know, for the first time in three years, uh, uh, India has now kind of come back to the uh, number one position, followed by China and Vietnam as a favorable uh, preferred destination for uh, middle-sized uh, companies there. Um, we have uh, Japan omnipresent, I should say, in every large infrastructure uh, project in India, whether it is the Delhi Metro, whether it is the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, the uh, you know, dedicated freight corridor. We have the Chennai-Bangalore uh, you know, uh, dedicated corridor. Um, and... Uh, uh, also, uh, above all, the flagship project of the, uh, you know, bullet train between Ahmedabad and uh, Mumbai. Apart from that, uh, Japan is firmly a part of, uh, uh, you know, Skill India, Digital India, Smart Cities. Uh, I must give you a couple of examples here of what I tried to do while I was there to ramp up this relationship. I'll give you three examples. One was this, uh, uh, you know, great uh, sort of uh, uh, effort that I made. Uh, when I went there, I saw that there were about uh, 1,000 Japanese companies in India. And we were uh, trying to ramp up Skill India. And uh, the Japanese are, are great at uh, you know, manufacturing skills and uh, you know, shop floor uh, uh, management and you know, uh, production, uh, Kaizen, Monozukuri, etc. And so I wrote to hundreds of CEOs saying, uh, would you please consider starting a small skills development center in India alongside your factory. A very humble, small uh, you know, shed could be put up. Maybe you can integrate with a regional engineering college. Maybe you can teach them some skills. Maybe this will give you uh, a steady flow of uh, recruits for your labor force. Uh, even if others poach your trained force, uh, they will still act as the uh, nucleus for uh, more change in the Indian economy. Take it that way. And uh, you can set up what you call some kind of training, uh, you know, uh, uh, what you call a polytechnic uh, program there. And uh, in about two or three years time, by the time I left at the end of 2018, we had succeeded in getting about almost eight to 10 very large companies committed to this in uh, setting up what is now known as the Japan India centers uh, of uh, manufacturing. Uh, and each of them had also linked up with a regional uh, sort of polytechnic or a, man, uh, or a regional engineering college uh, to create a um, uh, Japanese type of uh, uh, you know, teaching courses there as well. Uh, so I think that has come a long way today and it has helped India in terms of its uh, skills development program. Uh, the other point uh, which I thought was worth pursuing when I went there uh, was the Japanese uh, job market itself. Now I found that people from all over the world and notably from Asia, from the Philippines, from Vietnam, from Malaysia, Thailand, and even China, were coming in droves in their thousands uh, under something known as the Technical Intern Training Program. Um, you know, uh, TITP, Technical Intern Training Program. Now, this was a misnomer. It wasn't really a training program. It was a kind of uh, uh, job market where the Japanese, because of this problem of an aging society uh, and lack of uh, human resources, were actually importing large numbers of qualified people at various levels uh, 
uh, to attend to the job market in Japan. And when I went there, I found that uh, there were, uh, you know, 45,000 uh, Vietnamese, uh, uh, you know, 35,000, 38,000, uh, uh, sorry, 45,000 Filipinos, uh, 38,000 Chinese, um, uh, maybe 25,000 Vietnamese, but there were 58 Indians. And none of them have come, uh, had come under the TITP program. They had been brought in by companies like Suzuki for their in-house training programs. And I thought that was a shame. Uh, so for the next couple of years, vigorously pursued the TITP program. It required setting up a structure. It required creating uh, the right kind of uh, uh, sort of resource base in India for training, uh, you know, our people up to a certain level uh, in Japanese practices uh, as the sending side and on the receiving side, similar structures had to be created uh, with the approval of the regulatory uh, bodies in Japan uh, as the receiving side for placing these people uh, in various jobs in Japan. I'm happy to tell you with that uh, great struggle of three years, uh, we now have about 200 uh, such uh, people in Japan. Uh, I take full credit for that because it wasn't easy. And my logic was very simple that if we have the framework in place, then it's possible to scale from 200 to 2000 or 2000 to, uh, for instance, uh, uh, 200,000 at some stage, you know. And so we had to learn quickly from what the Filipinos did uh, or the Vietnamese did and uh, take a page out of their book. The third thing that I was very keen on and, and I think I quite uh, succeeded in, in, in doing was uh, in the healthcare sector. The logic of which today uh, cannot be underscored more as a result of the challenge that the pandemic has uh, you know, created for countries everywhere. And I found that in Japan, uh, they not only had fantastic healthcare uh, capabilities, uh, they were great manufacturers of medical equipment. They had a system in which their technologies frequently uh, got uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, sort of disapproved by the regulatory body. And there were companies with this technology that were, uh, you know, rather medium sized with 50 employees, family owned, uh, and they had nowhere to go once they couldn't sell in Japan. Uh, secondly, they had great experience in uh, geriatric and uh, trauma care, uh, two areas where India has not really put its heart into, uh, you know, sort of developing trauma care and in geriatric care. Um, and quite apart from that, uh, they uh, had their own market in Japan uh, for receiving Indian nurses and Indian healthcare workers. So this was going to be a two-way process. So uh, what I tried to do was to link them up first with the Ayushman Bharat program. Japan became the first country to connect with the Ayushman Bharat program. Within three weeks of the launch of that program in August 2018, uh, within four weeks of, or maybe six weeks, uh, by the time Prime Minister Modi came, uh, we had actually concluded uh, our uh, you know, agreements uh, with them. So that's something. And then also under our bilateral SIPA, uh, which was concluded in 2011, uh, we found that uh, it was very difficult to get nurses to come into uh, Japan, uh, you know, movement of people, no movement of persons, etc. Um, but it would be much easier to get healthcare workers to come in. Uh, so healthcare workers could also come in under the TITP program. And that too has started now. I'm happy to inform you. As far as ODA and FDI is concerned, uh, you know, uh, India over time became uh, the biggest recipient of uh, Japanese ODA. China at one point of time was very big, but gradually uh, that account uh, became smaller uh, and we started soaking up something like 3 to 3.5 billion US dollars worth of Japanese ODA every year. Nowadays, there is more competition in the region uh, because uh, Bangladesh, Indonesia uh, have also emerged as uh, large recipients of Japanese uh, ODA. Uh, and um, in terms of FDI, uh, over the years, Japan has now emerged as the fourth largest uh, um, uh, provider of uh, FDI in India. But that's somewhat misleading because when you look at the first three, they are uh, Singapore, Mauritius, and the Netherlands, which are all platforms for multi-source investments uh, across the world, whether in Mexico or whether in India. You might see Netherlands figuring somewhere very prominently. In the case of India, you will see Mauritius and Singapore uh, because of various uh, you know, agreements that are in place. Um, but as a single country, source of investment, uh, Japan is by far the biggest. 
with 33.5 billion dollars worth of cumulative investments in india since 2001 across all sectors and this is uh, much uh, larger than what the americans have invested or for that matter the french or the british and certainly uh, several times more uh, than what the chinese have invested japan is the only country in the world that has uh, 12 dedicated uh, country focused industrial townships uh, uh, in india and they're very active as you know in our make in india uh, program bilateral trade by the way is somewhat uh, uh, low stands at about 17.6 billion dollars um, and uh, it's not really growing as well as we would like it to grow but part of the reason there is that there is only so much of uh, you know textiles and uh, uh, gems and jewelry and and stuff like that that you can sell to the japanese uh, and um, so for that we have to be more competitive on uh, products that have value addition that are technologically more sophisticated that can pass uh, you know muster in the japanese uh, uh, competitive japanese market um, so uh, but i really frankly never thought much of trade uh, in comparison to fdi because i always believed that the real ballast in any economic relationship is provided by uh, you know investments and and more particularly mutual investments that's what makes for a robust economic partnership trade is fickle trade is uh, uh, something that grows it uh, you know waxes and wanes depending on global situations uh, even geo strategic uh, uh, factors can uh, drive up or drive down trade uh, but mutual investments causes countries to pause and think before decoupling or before taking dramatic decisions vis-a-vis -vis each other and and that can actually provide some stability in the broader theater uh, in asia as well so anyway uh, this is uh, by and large what i have said uh, uh, maybe a last word on the mahsr the maharashtra and mumbai amdabad the high speed rail project in many ways this is akin to as i said the suzuki project you know because it's uh, something that is going to uh, you know be a catalyst for rapid economic progress in my view technological growth and innovation uh, the vendor chains that will come in will be of great advantage to us we must realize that uh, we have to be aspirational in moving up uh, in terms of our innovation and technological capabilities uh, we don't always have to uh, the right to go in for the best you know um, yes it's true that uh, it's a lot cheaper to simply uh, tinker with and improve and upgrade the existing rail system to make it a little more high speed uh, and one doesn't have to go in for a bullet train technology there'll be that kind of criticism but unless you reach uh, you know for the sky uh, unless unless you 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 actually aspire to do uh, bigger things uh, you're not likely to uh, make uh, very great progress so there i would say one should learn uh, from the chinese as well uh, look at the speed with which they have revamped their railway uh, structure uh, their uh, infrastructure the roads in china the high speed rail i mean i used to sit in a train uh, you know all the way from shanghai to peking and it took 12 hours when i was talking to someone the other day and he said uh, he had just got off the train and it had taken 4 hours and this is uh, within uh, the last uh, you know 15 years uh, so change i think uh, necessarily uh, uh, demands that uh, one should also be aspirational about the kind of change we want um, uh, digital big data all the startup hubs is, is another area that uh, beckons us both india and japan uh, we have started the uh, first startup hub as you know in bangalore and um, there should be many more of these um, we should actually be looking at uh, uh, japan also as a formidable partner for us in terms of our act east policy and uh, connecting that with japan beginning with the northeast as you know that we have established an act east forum for that in december 2018 uh, master, and, yes master, if i may uh, we might want to wind up and, in the interest of Time. Yes, thank you. So I, I'll end with that. That uh, uh, you know, uh, connecting our uh, Actis policy with Japan's uh, uh, enhanced uh, uh, partnership for quality infrastructure, and working together in third countries, whether it is Southeast Asia, whether it is select countries in South Asia like Sri Lanka, uh, and and whether it is Africa, is something that can also provide uh, fresh impetus to our. special strategic and global partnership and thank you very much for that very patient
Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chinoy. I think you provided a very exhaustive uh, overview as well as uh, you kind of went into good depth on various aspects. I'm sure the audience has been hearing you with utmost interest. Uh, we will soon get to everyone for questions. I, I just wanted to have uh, your quick comments on a few things, maybe uh, some things that I would uh, want you to delve a bit more into. Um, and this is, and I, I will probably think of starting with the area of defense and the evolving India-China situation. Uh, we are aware uh, where things lie and uh, some, many of us would kind of speculate and think that the China-India economic rivalry as China's economic costs go up in production, the pandemic, et cetera, reduces investor interest in China. China is kind of, uh, kind of tinkering with other areas and trying to divert attention. That's some of the rhetoric that goes around. Now, come what may and whatever is, is true, uh, China is seen to become more and more aggressive uh, on the borders. Now, how do you think, uh, or what would be a reaction to the exercise that Japan and India could kind of jointly envisage? We've been seeing quite a few indications. I think there have been several signals. We are going to have joint fighter jet drill. <clears throat> We're going to have military supply sharing back, et cetera, et cetera. We already have joint naval exercises. We know that uh, you also mentioned about the Indo-Pacific and, uh, and its importance for Japan. So all put together, if uh, tensions were to rise, would we expect any joint exercise from uh, Japan, India, US put together? Is that, an, is that a foreseeable situation at all? Well, I think it's a two-part uh, question. Firstly, uh, the prospects for India becoming the next big destination for Japan uh, as the world uh, looks at the merits of decoupling uh, from China. My own view there is that uh, on trade, it's going to be very difficult for the world to decouple uh, with China and not uh, as suddenly as uh, they emotionally may want to uh, disconnect from that uh, uh, sort of interdependence that has been created over decades. It is going to be more feasible in uh, another area which is also being weaponized rapidly, that's technology. So when it comes to telecommunications, when it comes to uh, 5G, when it comes to artificial intelligence, when it comes to big data, IoT, etc., there is going to be uh, a, a sharper divide uh, at the global level between camps that are rapidly evolving. But I can't quite say that in the area of trade where there is weaponization, there is protectionism, there is a certain trend towards uh, regional FTAs, uh, there is a, a kind of uh, uh, trend towards, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, my country first um, uh, and uh, that too under difficult times. So I would say not much is going to happen on trade beyond a point in terms of decoupling from China. Let's be realistic about that. Um, and certainly Japan falls into that category where it's going to be very difficult uh, because what you're really saying is that if they have to decouple in terms of trade uh, and their supply chains, then they're kissing their own prosperity goodbye you know, and quite a, 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 in, a, in a sudden fashion without having created uh, necessary uh, support systems elsewhere. Technology, we will see more of it happening. Uh, uh, resilient supply chains, in my view, goes towards the uh, more technologically uh, high-end uh, trade part. So that's where it's more feasible. So trade and technology, two separate issues. Now, what can the others do in the evolving geostrategic uh, you know, situation vis-a-vis -vis China that India is facing today? Look, the fact of the matter is that the Quad is essentially a grouping uh, of uh, four like-minded countries. They happen to be democracies. Uh, in which uh, uh, three of them uh, are essentially countries with a maritime orientation, the United States, Japan, and Australia. Uh, one of them 
that is india has a maritime orientation uh, and challenges to deal with in the indian ocean both the western and eastern indian ocean uh, but also has continental uh, sort of chestnuts in the fire vis a vis uh, multiple adversaries at least two we can see you know that two of them uh, both china and pakistan now uh, among the quad three of them also have what you call alliance uh, treaties among themselves the americans have an alliance partnership with both japan and australia the japanese and the australians do not have an alliance partnership but the both of them have an alliance partnership with the one big power that matters that's the united states of america india has come closer to all three of them through various defense agreements but we do not have an alliance partnership with any uh, but yet america is our greatest defense partner today in terms of the number of exercises that we carry out uh, between Uh, the americans and us there are more exercises than what america conducts with any non uh, treaty alliance partner so uh, that does not mean that when we have a continental problem uh, of the type we are facing today that the quad can actually do anything about it the quad is useful at the same time i must uh, clarify this point in terms of uh, uh, you know supporting india's uh, values uh the fact that the chinese unilateralism and aggression today uh in the himalayas is of a piece with the kind of unilateralism aggression uh that they have uh, the disruption that they are causing in the east china sea the south china sea and in many other theaters uh, and that is a message that can go out not just from india but also from uh the uh other three uh and over time this gathers momentum you know it it it's something that they can help us do the three of them in the quad can also help india in terms of information sharing now that we have uh, agreements on protection of classified information uh, we should be able to do more information sharing there is already talk of india being part of the five eyes you know cooperative uh, arrangement there the intelligence sharing agreement with the united states in particular there is great scope to do much more uh, the us is a factor in uh, stability in the indo pacific uh, region and having very close and good relations with america for us also strengthens our hand vis-a-vis uh, you know the chinese because the external balancing is required at times and so from america's defense equipment and the latest technologies and hopefully it will not just be a buyer seller agreement uh, that like what we have done with the russians over time we can get the americans also to do more transfer of technology and manufacture in india and this may be helped by the fact that we signed recently the industrial security annex to the jisomia agreement of 2002 when rajnath singh uh, uh, ji went to uh, america last year uh, we concluded the isa agreement that paves the way for private sector participation also in defense manufacturing so this is something that we can look to but not necessarily that they come in uh, military fatigues and stand uh, shoulder to shoulder with you in the ic wastes of uh, ladakh right. right so i think uh, we'll we'll slowly open the floor for questions but uh, i think the chat window is populating as we speak the last one before i really take it there um you see india has was a part of the rcep negotiations the regional comprehensive economic partnership anchored by asean and its uh, six free trade agreement partners and uh, we pulled out at the last moment late last year the agreement is supposed to be implemented later this year in november and uh, japan has been part of rcp has been part of the erstwhile uh, tpp and took a leadership position in the cptpp and so on and so forth and you rightly mentioned um, as 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 i can borrow from your your talk uh foreign investment is is what is probably more important so trade will kind of rise and fall at the same time however most production is getting aligned in value chains and uh, investment and trade therefore get highly interrelated if we could say so now with india leaving rcp japan expressed that they would have probably love to see india there but uh, unfortunately that didn't happen in the backdrop uh, the resilient supply chain initiative is going on we also have atmanirbhar bharat we all know that india's uh, reticence towards giving more liberal or agreeing to more liberal 
tenets in a free trade agreement kind of hamper its potential. So uh, how, how, how would you think it would play out? Is this a serious thing that's going to pick up the RSCG, Resilient Supply Chain Group? Because I personally do not see much value in it without any ASEAN member coming in because it kind of links the region well. And for that to do, it would be a bad signal to China for that respective ASEAN country. Also, it would have intra-ASEAN dynamics that is going to kind of destabilize. So is there any possibility? How do you foresee things happening there? I think all of what you said is uh, very, very appropriate and apt. Uh, but uh, I would simply say that uh, it's a pity that we couldn't be part of the RCEP. It's not for want of trying. As you know, we negotiated in good faith. Uh, but uh, as you would know better, at the end of the day, our concerns on a number of issues were not being met. Uh, there was the elephant in the room in terms of the Chinese economy. Uh, we were not being cut uh, the deal that we were seeking. Uh, some kind of insurance, some kind of coverage uh, to ensure that uh, we do not uh, end up uh, capsizing even more in terms of uh, you know, imports from China through third countries, etc. Of course, China was not the only elephant in the room. There were smaller elephants in the room in terms of agriculture, the dairy industry. And uh, so others were also involved, like uh, New Zealand, etc. Um, so uh, the, sh the short point here is that when we found that there was no, uh, you know, sort of uh, chance to progress more, uh, we decided to press the, uh, you know, eject uh, button and, uh, you know, got ourselves uh, out of that, uh, that grouping. Uh, so that's uh, lamentable in many ways, but I guess uh, only time will tell uh, uh, how much of a price we will pay for that. Uh, now, if it is accompanied by uh, the right kind of uh, you know, policy reforms at our end, and we are able to create the right kind of uh, uh, you know, domestic uh, uh, framework to kickstart our economy, more particularly in light of uh, COVID, uh, then we might be able to play a little bit of catch up. Uh, uh, but I feel that on uh, resilient supply chains, um, firstly, you know, it's going to be very difficult, as I said, for others to simply pack their bags and leave from China. Uh, so, uh, because, you know, it's not as if the US government and the Japanese governments is, can simply crack a whip and say, uh, all right, the lot of you, please get out of China now. It doesn't work that way. There are rules, there are regulations, uh, you know, government has to bring out all kinds of uh, uh, credible legislation to prevent A or B from happening. Uh, and uh, uh, industry voices will also come in. Uh, they will speak of uh, uh, the kind of disruption that this will cause. So uh, that being said, I think Japan can play a key role in this. Because if Japan decides to come in, in say specialized areas like semiconductors, for instance, uh, uh, then uh, we can do a lot more. And why just Japan? I think there is an opportunity here uh, for us uh, to work with Taiwan as well, because even Taiwan has this uh, extreme, uh, you know, dependence on mainland China uh, for its uh, investments in some of these key areas. And like all others, uh, Jap uh, uh, you know, Taiwan is also looking to reduce its uh, dependence. Of course, let's not forget that Taiwan has also been a beneficiary of the decoupling process. Uh, so people have, in fact, uh, put more in Taiwan. But let's try to work on one or two countries uh, in specific right. terms. And I would say Japan and um, uh, the United States, of course, and uh, also Taiwan can play a role in bringing some of the resilient supply chains to India. And this will not happen because it's part of our wish list. It will have to meet everybody's requirements. It will have to be globally attractive and competitive. Okay. One or two questions from, from the chat window, I think. Uh, uh, we would all want to know if things are going to change with the new prime minister taking office in Japan. You kind of alluded that he's kind of stay for a couple of years as per the term, and his views would be more aligned to Abe. But uh, are there any focused areas where things could uh, be different? So I feel that there is a uh, sort of uh, across the political spectrum kind of support for developing closer relations with India. Uh, mm -hmm. And that will go beyond uh, uh, 
Prime Minister Suga as well. Whether Prime Minister Suga stays on at the LDP presidential elections in September 2021 is a moot question. Uh, but whoever comes to power uh, will continue down the path of developing closer engagement with India. That being said, I think the bigger difference that is there in the political spectrum in Japan is with regard to uh, the uh, policies towards China. Within the LDP itself, there are so many factions. The LDP appears to be a monolithic party, but it's actually uh, uh, an amalgamation of several political parties uh, with their own philosophies. We call them factions uh, of the LDP, but they are, they're quite sometimes diametrically opposite one from the other. And um, there are voices in the LDP that are extremely pro-China. Uh, there are some that are more uh, pronounced in terms of their anti-China sentiment. So that's where things can change. That's where the Abe line may not hold uh, beyond uh, Suga. Uh, if uh, the LDP throws up a leader uh, who actually seeks uh, more accommodation with China. It's a moot question how far that can go because Japan has to continue to take some kind of lead from the United States of America. So it cannot do something that is completely, uh, you know, uh, runs counter to what the U.S. is trying to do, because that's the nature of the beast. That's the nature of their own relationship. And that also helps India, because as the United States focuses more on India, again, the Japanese are tempted to do more with India. But uh, China and the economic relationship there has a unique character of its own. And uh, people like uh, the LDP... Uh, Secretary uh, General, uh, Mr. Uh, Toshihiro Nikai, for instance, who heads his own faction but is like the backroom uh, you know, player there, the kingmaker. Um, he's the one who's been leading the charge of the Light Brigade, for instance, for having better relations and closer relations with China. And they are quite influential in Japanese politics. Thank you, Ambassador. I think uh, we've had a productive session today and uh, there were quite a few questions also that we kind of work through quickly. So all in all, I think uh, people would want to have more of you, but in the interest of time, we have to bring it to a close. So I thank you very much again for this very informative and educative session. I personally benefited a lot. Uh, thank you very much for interacting with me as well. And with that, I hand it back to uh, my colleague, Professor Rahul Seth. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador, it is a pleasure and it's a pleasure to see you after a long time. It was extremely refreshing. Uh, we wish to, and I second what Professor Mukherjee said, we wish to have more of you in our midst. Thank you so much. So we have Shubhangi, who is our student to lead the valediction. So Shubhangi, if you may. It was indeed a great session, sir. Now I would like to share some key takeaways from the session. Thank you, Sujan Sunoy, sir for letting us know the great insights into the historical connect between India and Japan and how the things unfold too. You also discussed about the strategic relations between India and Japan and how the historical relationships fall through the musical instruments, fondness of Indian goddess and the Chinese goddess. He discussed the omnipresence of Japan in India and how it emerged as the fourth largest FDI in India. The way forward is how, how the two countries can work together in the third nation, which is can be the way ahead. I'll float a feedback form in the chat and I would request everyone to fill it before leaving. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Ambassador, uh, as we be bid adieu, uh, we uh, you know part ways in a very happy note and we wish to continue this deliberation. This is just the beginning. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Namaste and sayonara, if I may use that term. And I wish you all good health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.
संपत या फरीद शुड आई स्टॉप इट आई थिंक या वी कैन स्टॉप स्ट्रीमिंग